Today's sermon is the parable of the good heretic. The parable of the good heretic. I didn't know there were good heretics. Well, we'll keep going. Holy love lives. You know, we're living in volatile times here in the 21st century, and I'm not just talking about the wars and some natural disasters that have been occurring, but I'm talking about the whole climate, so to speak, of people spiritually and politically. These are fraught times with all kinds of conflict and culture wars. If you didn't realize that, I can talk to you later about that, but there's a lot of cultural warfare going on. There's a lot of conflict. What is the Christ response to this? What is the Christian, the Christian response? If we're going to be with Jesus, follow Jesus, how do we respond to a world, a nation, even sometimes a local community full of conflict and culture wars? Well, we need to know what we believe that involves conviction, and we need to believe what we supposedly believe. That involves conviction. But some other terms I want to lay before you, and this is a way of life. Conviction flowing into courage, the courage of our convictions, and what does that mean? If I have the courage of my convictions, do I take a sword and go chop people's heads off? No, Jesus says that's not his way. That may be other religions' ways. That's not his way. That's an abomination for Christians, although some Christians do it that way. Do I attack do I badmouth other people since they badmouth me? No. Different kind of courage. The courage of our convictions is going to lead us in Christ in a very different way to compassion and to the commission that he gives us as a church and as Christians who are part of his body, his church. In a great address decades ago, in another turbulent time, Reverend Dr. Ed Clowney talked about the fact that we as the church and as Christians, even though we hold to our convictions firmly, need to move from a clenched fist to a bowed head. From a clenched fist to a bowed head. And that speaks to where we'll be heading in some ways in the month of May as we begin to look at, by, by early May, looking at a life of prayer. Certainly that's part of the bowed head, but the bowed head is also about humility before the Lord, rather than getting our heads up. And humility even as we go to others in compassion, in the commission that Christ gives us. And that brings us back to what we're looking at today. The parable of the good heretic. Holy love lives. Now we're going to open up and turn to Luke chapter 10 verses 21 through 37. Again, we looked at this last week. I would encourage you if you for some reason missed the sermon, have not been able to access the sermon yet, you want to access last week's sermon about love's legacy, your love's legacy, death or life. We looked at, and I looked at as I told you, the flow of verses 21 through 24 into the opening segment of our passage. You just have to catch all these connections. There's a context to what we're going to arrive at today, which is the second most famous parable, probably, that Jesus ever told, the parable of which is typically called the Good Samaritan, and I'm calling the Good Heretic today. Uh, but before we got there last week, we really dug into, and I gave you a lot of detail on the exchange between Jesus and the expert in the law and what's going on there and what's going on vis-a-vis -vis Old Testament passages. I'll refer to that a bit today, but you want to connect that sermon with this one. Today we're moving on primarily and ultimately focusing on the parable itself. Now here now, God's word, Luke chapter 10, verses 21 through 37. In that same hour, he, Jesus, rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father. As I mentioned several weeks ago, it's a great Trinitarian moment in prayer in the scripture. In the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the learned and wise and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me 
by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and whomever the Son chooses to reveal him. Then turning to the disciples in private, he, Jesus, said to them, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you, many prophets and kings wish to see the things you see, and they did not see them, and to hear the things you hear, and they did not hear them. And behold, remember we're supposed to catch that, like the French would say, voila, here it is. Case in point, off of the hidden from the supposedly wise and learned revealed little children. And voila, and behold, an expert in the law stood up to put him to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Then he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, you have answered rightly. This do, do, and you shall live. But desiring to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was coming down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the opposite side. But a Samaritan, one who was journeying, came upon him, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. And going to him, he bound up his wounds after pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which one of these three, do you think, proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the one who did the act of mercy with him. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. So today we come to the parable of the good heretic and the gospel that holy love lives. Now, I want you to get the scene that we're going to come back to again and again, but the scene is this. With the naked beaten to near death man who apparently is a Jew in Jesus' story it would be a Jew he may be unidentifiable because he's basically stripped naked and all bloody so we don't have the indications of the clothing okay, the tallit and everything that a Jewish man would wear but this is a Jew in this story with a naked beaten to near death apparently Jewish man strapped atop his animal a hated Jews hate Samaritans in these days, in first century Judea. A hated Samaritan comes into Jewish Jericho and checks into a public inn. That may not shock you, and you may say, yeah, I heard that story, Pastor Martin, when I was in third grade Sunday school. I kind of know all about the, you know, this is shocking. This is shocking stuff. Off the charts, shocking. Uh, you know, I have the illustration for you, the beautiful illustration, striking il illustration, the painting from Van Gogh, which is modeled after the etching, you may know, by Dredelcois, um, of 
the Good Samaritan and the man who's half dead, you know, being saved by the Good Samaritan. But maybe I need to give you a more striking image um, because you can imagine uh, this scene in 2020 in London when there was an anti-racism march in London. These things were going on in all the major cities around the world. In this case, which happened in other places in the United States too, some white supremacist activists came and attacked, uh, tried to disrupt the... uh, the, the march, and uh, a number of the white supremacists started a big fight, and one guy got into a fight, and he was about to get stomped down uh, in the masses of the march, and this heroic uh, black man stepped in, fought everybody off, picks up this guy, and saves him from bad injury or even death, carrying him to safety. Now that maybe gets our attention a little bit more. You can imagine like maybe also a Native uh, American or Indian riding into Amarillo with a bloodied, near-dead cowboy strapped over his animal. How well do you think he would have been received in 1880 Amarillo? Probably not that well, or maybe a Mexican coming up from Mexico. Same kind of thing, So, but wait a minute, we're gonna go deeper than that because beyond racism and bad blood hatred, most first century Jews abhorred Samaritans, not just because of all the ethnic stuff and not just because of racism and not just because the bad centuries where the Samaritans had tried to stop the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem at the time of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, Not, not just that, but related to that because the Samaritans were heretics in the eyes of all Jews, heretics who denied, first of all, the exclusive import and necessity of Jerusalem as the holy city of God, and there at the center, Zion, right? The temple, the Samaritans did not acknowledge the temple of the Jews, did not go to the temple of the Jews. And the Jews, according to their understanding of scripture and God, was it's all about centering on the temple. The Samaritans denied that, and related to that, the Samaritans also denied the authority of much of the Old Testament. They had their own version of the first five books of the Bible. It's called the Samaritan Pentateuch, okay? Uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy, but you can think of the Jehovah's Witnesses have their own version of the New Testament, right? Uh, by the way, uh, Muslims have their own version of the story of Jesus. So. They did not, the Samaritans did not acknowledge most of the rest of what we would call the Old Testament, in fact, any of it, and did not click with the basic theological statements of much of the Old Testament. So these are not just half-breeds in the eyes of Jews. They are outright, you know, just horrible heretics. Now, behold, in our story, an expert in the law stood up to put Jesus to the test saying, teacher, what must I do to inherit zoe naonion, eternal life? This is, as we saw last week, not an earnest question of a humble man just seeking salvation and a word from God. That's not, that's not what's going on here. This is, we talked about it last week, but let me put it boldly to you today, connecting with our theme for today. This expert in the law is not seeking salvation, but he is giving what? a heresy test to Jesus. It is a heresy test that he is giving to Jesus. And he is trying to figure out whether Jesus is gonna violate conservative orthodoxy and therefore be condemned under Jewish law. That's, we are at that stage of Jesus's ministry. This is a heresy test. He said to him, Jesus responds on, you know, who's my neighbor? Uh, Excuse me, before you get to who's my neighbor, Uh, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, uh, what is written in the law? How do you read it? How do you interpret it? So Jesus puts the question back to him. The answer is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, at the kind of core, the nub, the heart of what's called the Shema. And then Leviticus 19, 18, and your neighbor as yourself. The second tablet of the law and Jesus said you have answered correctly this do and you will live you shall live last week we dug into this more 
your love's legacy, death or life. Remember that your love is going to lead you. Everybody loves something. They may love money. They lo may love themselves. They may love the devil. I don't know. But your love is going to lead you either to death or life. Contrary to what this world says, not every love is good. It doesn't justify everything. So your love is either going to lead you to death or to life. And basically, is it love of myself? A lot of so-called Christians are actually in love with themselves and what God can do for them, right? Is it love of myself or is it actual love of God? Death or life? The Shema put this before us. We looked at the primer last week on Old Testament law grounded in the Shema and the issue of love. And then where the rubber hits the road with the, what Jesus goes to. Because remember, Jesus is going to talk to you in your terms and your values. And as the Bible says, as Jesus says, you will ultimately be judged by your own words. You know, at the judgment in eternity, when you stand before Jesus, you will be judged by your own words. This guy's an expert in the law, so Jesus is going to go deep into the law with this guy, deeper than this guy's probably really thought about. So Jesus takes him to the rubber hit the road, you know, Leviticus 18, verse 5. The Lord, the Lord God says, keep my statutes and my justice. If a person does them, he shall live by them. That's what Jesus is quoting, and Jesus is stepping in and saying, I am the Lord God himself in the present with you. I'm in the flesh right in front of you. And that's what Jesus is saying, if this guy actually <laughs> understands what's happening, when Jesus says, this do and you shall live. Jesus is speaking as God. Okay? He's speaking just like he spoke into the words of Leviticus 18, and he's confronting the man with an opportunity for the man to realize who he is and how the man is no way fulfilling the law, is not truly doing the law to its fullness, to its perfection for his own salvation. And this is a moment for repentance. Talked about that last week. So notice the way it matches out. The Lord God in Leviticus says, a person does them, he shall live by them. And Jesus says here in Luke chapter 10, this do and you shall live, you will live. But the guy doesn't take the opportunity to repent and be saved, right? Because he's into himself and his own knowledge and his own view on things. You ever talk to somebody like that? Wanting to justify himself. This is at least at two levels. He wants to like make himself look good because this is why he's here in the first place, to show how much better he is than Jesus. And ultimately, yeah, he's probably, the whole point of his life is to justify himself. Again, there's a whole lot of people out there trying to justify themselves. Some of them by the Bible, some by other values. Some of them by the latest tolerance standards. Justify themselves. He said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, this is a big biblical intellectual conversation among rabbinic Jews. Okay? In the first century and all the way through. You see it in the Mishnah and in the Talmud too. Does it include only observant Jews as my neighbor? Do I have to be good only to observant Jews? Or do I have to be good to bad Jews also, unobservant Jews? Do I have to be good, as the law indicates, to aliens living among us and strangers living among us? But, but what if the communities are mixed? Like, I don't have to go into Samaria and fool with them, do I? Even though, you know, geographically, in some sense, they're our neighbor. They're not, like, living with us. So that doesn't include Samaritans, does it? And it certainly doesn't include the Romans, even though physically they're present. They're oppressors. So they, they certainly are not neighbors, right? You can imagine the Jews arguing about this all the time. You know, how narrow or how moderately wide do we need to make the circle to make sure we fulfill the law perfectly and God loves us and we're his people? This is where this guy's going with this question. And Jesus responds totally different than this guy's ever heard. And again, an opportunity for this guy and for you and me to realize who Jesus is and fall on our face before him. Jesus responds with a prophetic pilgrim's gospel with seven scenes in chiasm. That's what he does. If you know Hebrew poetry, if you know the way the Bible works, if you know how to read the Bible, and again, we don't, I, I can't give you all that in a sermon. Come to Bible study with me. You know, come on Sunday morning. Come on Tuesday morning. Come on Wednesday night. But, but let me just go ahead and lay this before you. This is a prophetic pilgrim's gospel in seven scenes in chiasm like you see tracking through the Bible. Okay? It occurs a number of times. If you're paying attention to the structure, the poet structure of the Bible. Let me just tell you, let me remind you that in, in the Bible, the number seven bespeaks 
divine completeness or perfection. The number seven. And that's because one of the numbers that indicates God is three. And the number that indicates his creation is four. Like north, south, east, west. Like the four winds. Okay, So three plus four equals seven. So it has to do in particular with the creator interacting with his creation. That's the seven completion number. Also secondarily, 12. Three times four, 12. That's why there are 12 tribes. That's why there are 12 apostles. So just remember that. But, but here we're really going to a seven number and seven scenes. So Jesus is not randomly telling a story. He's brilliantly laying out an entire gospel in structure of poetry. Okay, so let me just go ahead and tell you up front, and we'll come back to it. The central scene of the seven is, of course, number four. So you really need to pay attention where we're going to go to the central thrust, the pivot of number four, and what's going to happen in scene four. Well, let me remind you, when we look at another seven-scene pilgrimage prophecy in the Bible, one that you probably know, Psalm 23, right? If you, think, if you know, Psalm 23 is in seven scenes. If you've studied Psalms, you know this, right? And what is the central scene of the seven? God, and God being Emmanuel, God with us, so right? Though I walk, this is the scene, number four of the seven in Psalm 23. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That's the pivot. That's the central one of the seven scenes. Now, I think Jesus is in direct conversation with several others like Isaiah 24, but also definitely Psalm 23 when he's laying this out before the guy. Because remember, back in this same chapter of Luke, Luke 10 too, Jesus says, behold, I send you out as what? lambs among wolves. If you're a Bible reader, you're supposed to catch this. If you like the scripture, if you like Jesus, you're supposed to catch this. So the parable of the Samaritan is a seven-scene, chiastic, prophetic gospel for us about how we live our lives as Christians, as pilgrims, as wayfarers out in the world. And again, the central pivotal scene here, number four, is the Samaritan is going to see and act in compassion. He's going to see and act in compassion. That's number four. Let me give you one other background before I take you through the seven scenes. In Judaism, there are three categories of worshipers. Three categories. They're priests. They're Levites who serve the priest. Okay? The Levites enter into the court of priests, but never go. Levites never go to the holy place. The priests get all the way to the holy place. And then there's the court of Israel, which are Israelites who are not clergy. So you got it? Priest, Levite, and then observant Jews. Now, if I'm a Jew telling a story and I take you through a priest and a Levite, who's supposed to come next? A non-clergy Jew. So you're supposed to be ready for the shock at that level, too, because does Jesus, is the third person in this story who's going to act going to be an observant Jew? No. Okay, now let's go through the scenes. Scene number one. And remember, scene one is going to play off of scene seven and vice versa all the way through. This is the way the poetry works, right? Scene number one, robbers take and disregard the man's life. Scene number two, priest sees, does nothing, travels apart, keeps himself safe and in orthodox purity. Okay, so at one level he's avoiding danger because the robbers may still be around, but at a deeper level he is avoiding, he's, he's staying within the circle of who his neighbor is, and this Jew cannot be identified because he's stripped, so you can't see Judaic clothing on him. And besides, he's probably dead. He's probably defiled. And if I go near him, I will be defiled. And I'm on my way from Jerusalem down to Jericho. 
I don't want to go back to Jericho, have the humiliation of coming back as a priest who is defiled. Can you believe it? And then have to go through all the rigmarole of being, you know, reconsecrated when I don't have to fool with this. And besides, it's dangerous. And who is this guy anyway? And he's probably dead already anyway, right? You know how to make excuses, right? You know how to make so He's probably dead already. Okay. So, I, you know, so he, the priest, keeps himself religious and pure and orthodox. That's our priest. That's scene number two. Number three, the Levite does, we think, well, the Levite's their servant oriented. Maybe they'll help out. No. Same thing. Levite does nothing does not act at all, maintains his orthodox purity going to the opposite side, just like the priest. Now, of course, if I were already highlighted, the heretic, the Samaritan, wait a minute, I thought this was going to be observing you. No, it's a Samaritan, it's a heretic. Uh, he sees, has compassion, and acts to save the unclean man. Now, if you're a Christian, you should start be getting some connection on this. This guy steps in to save an unclean person. And let's go even deeper. Esplanaxi. Esplanaxi. Here, the term that's used is from a verb that is used 12 times, no joke, 12 times in the New Testament. It means his bowels are moved within him, like his inner parts are moved so that he wants to love this guy. He has, he's, he's so compassionate. It's used 12 times in the New Testament. Okay, variant forms of that verb, 12 times. I'm not making this up 12 times. Remember 12, right? Okay. 10 times Jesus. 10 times Jesus. Jesus has compassion on the crowds. Jesus has compassion on the woman. Jesus has compassion on people, 10 times. The next one, in Jesus' most famous parable, the prodigal son, which we'll eventually get to, it's only in Luke, it's in Luke 15. The father sees and has compassion on the prodigal son. So we got 11. Where's the 12th? The parable of the good heretic. Right there, at the center. You're catching this, right? At the center of the seven seen prophecy. Number five from Jesus, the fifth scene. Heretic travels with man in a deadly, unsafe manner, making himself unclean. Because remember, he's under the Samaritan Pentateuch. So he's unclean by Samaritan standards now. But he's going to be with the man and he's going to carry the man. Okay, opposite, opposite the priest. Number six, the Samaritan goes on and takes the man into a Jewish city. He's going into Jericho. Remember, they're on the road down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Do Jews like to see Samaritans? Do Jews like to see Samaritans showing up with a bloody man and trying to check into an inn? What do you think? No, I don't think so. Is this guy subjecting himself to possibly being killed? Yes. By a gang later that night? Yes. When he tries to leave in the morning? Yes. He is putting his life on the line for this other man that he's saving. So the Samaritan takes a man into a Jewish city, into a public inn, a public inn. Again, can you, you know, the idea of the, like the Indian showing up into Amarillo and going up to the saloon and saying, you got a room upstairs I can rent tonight with this white guy I have strapped over my horse? What do you think? Safe? No. And then number seven, heretic gives, pays, exorbitantly and guarantees he's going to return and guarantees he will pay the entirety of the debt. So seven is opposite number one, the robbers who take everything from the man. This guy, the Samaritan, is going to give everything, everything that is necessary. Christian, who are you seeing in this story? Who pays your debt, guarantees he will return for you and make all things right? Who is this? Let 
you catch this, right? The expert in the law is accusing Jesus of being a heretic, and the hero of the story is the heretic who is an analog to Jesus. So back to what we're supposed to do and be. James 1.22 says, be doers of the word, not hearers only. This is not for our intellectual scintillation. This is for a way of life. Are you with Jesus or not? James 2, 15 through 17, talks about a brother or sister without clothing in need of daily food. I hope you're the, you're the person in the, in the crowd who goes to the, to the guy who needs help, right? And we as a church, we need to be that church that goes to the people who need help. In the same way, faith by itself, that's not accompanied by action, is dead. Jesus, talking about the final judgment in Matthew chapter 25, says... The Son of Man will come, that's Jesus, the Son of Man will come and take judgment. And he will separate the sheep from the goats. Which ones are we going to be, right? Sheep or goats? Jesus says he's going to put on his right side the sheep. They're the righteous ones. And Jesus will say, you know, you did awesome. You really did. My spirit was working through you, basically. The righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? See you a stranger and welcome you. Naked, clothe you. See you thirsty and give you something to drink. When did we see you in prison and go to visit you? I mean, I I was busy and I was going to ball games and going on trips and stuff and, you know, worried about myself. So I never saw you, Jesus. But I did help those folks. I mean, I stopped my normal track pattern and helped people. And Jesus is going to say, yeah, that was actually me. Then the king will answer them, truly, I say... You did it to the least of these, my brothers. He's talking about principally Christians in the church now here. Christians in need, right? As you did to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And then he's going to say to the goats, you didn't help when I was hungry, when I was thirsty, when I needed clothing, I was naked. When I was in the prison, you didn't come to me. And they're going to say, Lord, we we never saw you. He's going to say, I'm telling you, that was me. That was me when your brothers whether it's in Ukraine or in, you know, Jackson, Mississippi, wherever, you know, down at Walnut Grove where I go, look, that's me, Jesus is saying. I'm involved there. So here's our invitation to move from what cable news and social media tends to put us on, which is either La La Land or clenched fist, neither one of those, to move from a clenched fist or La La Land to a bowed head. Now we're not talking about condoning heresy, not compromise on the truth, but we are talking about Christ following conviction for you, for me as Christians, and for us as the church together. Again, I want to highlight this for you. Scene seven, that so-called heretic, gives or pays exorbitantly, guarantees his own return. Christ does that for us, and since he first loved us, we are called also to love others. Well, that'll cost me. And some of that could be dangerous. Yeah, you believe in the shepherd? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. You believe him? I'm not talking about foolishness, but I'm talking about clear, courageous compassion and commission. So Jesus teaches the teacher, the tester, and turns the neighbor question on its head. He doesn't answer the question about, well, define neighbor for me. He says the issue is, are you going to be, are you going to act as a neighbor, which turns everything on its head. Which of these three proved to be a neighbor, do you think? To the man who fell among the robbers. Now, of course, the guy can't say Samaritan, you know, it's just abhorrent to him. But he answers even better, because he he gives the kind of language Jesus has been used. I suppose the one who did the act of mercy with him, and it's literally with him. In other words, he was with the guy. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. Prove in the testing of life. Christian, prove in the testing of life to be a neighbor, to be Christ-like. James 2 says, if you really keep the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. And here's the promises from Jesus. We move from courage to compassion to commission, and in the midst of this, the revelation of Jesus himself. 
John 14, verse 21, Jesus says this, The one who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and reveal myself to him. There's the connection with the opening of our passage for today. The revelation comes that way. Speaking of revelation, remember Revelation chapter 3, verse 19 and 20. Jesus says to the churches, this is to the churches now, to us together. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. And sometimes that's going to be a neighbor in need, friend. And then catch this connection from Revelation 3 back to Jesus' words in John 14. If anyone loves me, he will obey my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him. Okay? Anyone opens the door, okay. we will come to him and make our home with him. So let's move as a church and let us move as Christians from a clenched fist to a bowed head. Holy love lives. And when we love Jesus and understand that he first loved us and open our hearts to his love, he'll transform us. And we will be powerful by the power of his spirit in real love for others. Don't you want to be set free in his love? Come to Jesus. Open the door for Jesus. Be set free in his love to be a loving neighbor to all. And when we are loving neighbors to all, guess what? Everybody is our neighbor, even the least and the last and the lost. And frankly, some of the craziest people we meet that you would say, why would I want to fool with them? Well, you know what? Jesus may be calling you to. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.